Want to turn your business into a household name? Nine Ad Manager puts your business in the biggest shows on Nine Now, Australia's most watched free streaming TV platform. Create your campaign, manage when it runs, who it reaches, and track how it performs. You can even create your own video ad, all for only $550. Turn your business into a household name with Nine Ad Manager. To learn more or to get started now, just visit nineadmanager.com.au. From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Please Explain. I'm Samantha Selinger Morris. It's Tuesday, October 31. Last week, Lily James, a water polo coach at an elite school in Sydney, was found dead. Her death sent shockwaves not just through her school community, but across Australia. In part, it was because of her youth and innocence. She was only 21 and was found dead in the school in which she worked. But it was also because of the circumstances of her death. The man suspected of killing her was a fellow staff member with whom she had had a brief relationship. But as shocked as people are, James's death touches on a much wider problem in our country because the number of women who are murdered by a partner or former partner keeps rising every year. Today, Chief Reporter Jordan Baker and Dr. Kate Fitzgibbon, Director of the Gender and Family Violence Prevention Centre at Monash University, join me to discuss what we know about what happened to Lily James and what our communities need to prevent more women from dying at the hands of those they know. So, Jordan, last week, 21-year-old Lily James was found dead in a bathroom of the Sydney High School where she worked. Can you first tell us about how this shocking crime occurred? So Lily James was 21. She worked part-time as a water polo coach at St Andrews Cathedral School. On Wednesday, she was working in the afternoon with some students. She had had a brief relationship with another of the sports assistants, a guy called Paul Fison. He met her after the training. At about 7 o'clock, we know that they went into a bathroom off the gym together. They suggested there may have been an argument caught on the CCTV as well. He came out just over an hour later, drove to the cliffs around Ball Clues. Uh, More CCTV captures him getting out of the car around nine, dumping something in a bin, which we now believe to have been a murder weapon. And just before midnight, he called police to tell them that there was a body at St Andrews Cathedral School. So when police got there that night... They went to the bathroom next to the gymnasium and found Lily James's body. Now, police say it was an extremely confronting scene. It was a brutal attack. She had suffered severe head injuries. We believe that the uh, murder weapon was an implement like a hammer. The police began a massive manhunt around ball clues. Good evening. Police are tonight hunting for an employee at a Sydney private school suspected over the brutal murder of a colleague inside the CBD campus. 21-year-old Lily James... His phone call alerted them to where he was, so they were able to search for him very quickly. About 36 hours later, they pulled out a body from the cliffs down near Borclues, which has been identified as his. It seemed to point very much to him. He, they had been in a brief relationship uh, for about five weeks and had broken up just before the murder. We know that too, that that is a real danger point in intimate partner violence. We know that separations can be really a trigger point for controlling men. So, yes, yeah, so the, the pieces start to fall together very quickly for the place. And so can you tell us a bit more about Lily James? What was she like and have her family spoken about what's happened? By all accounts, Lily James was just an absolutely lovely, clever, kind, hardworking young woman. She grew up in the South Sydney area, so the Cogra, San Susie area. She went to an Anglican school in her school called Dane Bank, where she also did a bit of coaching. Great dancer, great sportswoman, age champion swimmer, had really sort of thrown herself into her student life at UTS. She had great hopes and plans for the future. She was a wonderful friend. Her parents sent out a statement on Friday. Obviously, there's a huge amount of interest in this case. 
expressing how horrendously heartbroken and devastated they were and how much they loved her. It's just such a horrendous waste of such a promising young woman. And so why do you think this crime has resonated with so many people? Well, there are a lot of factors about this case that make it really shocking. Her youth, she was only 21. She was barely out of school, barely begun her adult life. The fact that the killer was a co-worker and he was an alumnus of the school. The fact that it happened at a school, I mean, these are safe spaces. And obviously it's also every woman's worst nightmare. And the head of St Andrews, Dr Julie McGonagall, she released a statement shortly after this crime was uncovered, stating that, of course, this has been very upsetting for the school's students. So what can you tell us about how this has impacted the school community? So 4.30 on Thursday morning, so merely hours after the attack, the school issued a uh, text message to parents saying it would be closed on Thursday and Friday. The kids who were sitting their HSC and IB exams had to sit them elsewhere, which would have been horrifying for those kids to have to sit exams having this going on. The school was dealing with the police. These two people were its employees. And Paul Fison was an alumnus of St Andrew's Cathedral School. He's a Dutch national who had spent year 10 to year 12 there, had been the sports captain. So a lot of the teachers there knew him. The students and teachers also knew Lily James. So it's an absolutely horrendous thing to have to get your head around. The school had a meeting of teachers with the New South Wales Police on Friday afternoon. Uh, they sort of briefed them on the case, told them that, you know, this was an unforeseeable thing. Today there was a special assembly as school resumed. The gymnasium is out of bounds. The foyer area of the school is out of bounds. We have counsellors that have been sent in front of the schools. We have chaplains. You know, they're really, really drawing on all possible resources to ensure that the students get every support they can while doing something that's really sort of unthinkable for all of us to have to do, to sort of push forward, you know, with their education, with their school day, with their jobs, while trying to get their head around this horrible thing that's happened to them. And what happens with the police investigation from here? How will her family get answers and will they? So from here on in, the, the police will be preparing a briefing for the coroner. So the police will be looking and are, are already investigating the circumstances of this. They have, you know, obviously interviewed a lot of people at the school. They have uh, raided his house. They will be speaking to people who knew Paul Fison. They'll be speaking to people who knew Lee James and put together a picture of what happened into the lead up to this. But the truth is, you know, we may never know and probably will never know and Lily James's family will probably never get the answer to why this young man did that thing to this incredibly innocent young woman in the toilets that night. I hope that Lily James's family at least gets some answers, but often in these sort of cases, families are left asking that question for decades. Thank you so much, Jordan, for your time. Thanks, Matt. After the break, Dr. Kate Fitzgibbon on what messages our communities and politicians need to hear. Dr. Fitzgibbon, thank you so much for joining us on Please Explain. As someone who's worked in the gendered and family violence space for more than a decade, what went through your head when you first heard about the death of Lily James? As many Australians, I'm sure, had a similar reaction. It was one of horror. Uh, and surprise. I think the youth of both the victim and the perpetrator involved has really shocked everybody and has led to a lot of questions. It's interesting for me, though, in how we do get shocked because violence against women and the killing of women by male violence in Australia is a relatively common occurrence. But we do have these cases that really grab the nation's attention. I think certainly the horrific killing of Lily James has done that. So what's really important now is that we ask the really important questions that have to be asked. What could we do to prevent this? We know that men's violence against women is preventable. When you say that it is preventable, it's obviously fantastic to hear that. But how? How is this preventable? What is needed that we're not providing currently? Yeah, so we know that men's violence against women is underpinned by gender inequality. And we know that there are often a range of different behaviours, 
problematic attitudes that underpin these acts of violence that are identifiable in hindsight and could be identifiable and prevented if the right mechanisms were in place. It takes a really long time to change attitudes and behaviours, to change the systemic gender inequality that sits across the Australian community. So these aren't easy answers. There aren't going to be single programs or activities that the government can fund. So what we need is sustained long-term investment from state, territory and the federal government into prevention and early intervention. So tell us a bit more about that, because we do have federal and state governments that say they are committed to addressing violence against women. But as you mentioned, the numbers of women that are being killed yearly by their partners, by former partners, is absolutely astounding. So tell us, what do federal and state governments need to be doing that they are not just not doing? So this is a little bit of a complex question because we absolutely have to celebrate the positive steps forward. But while we've had unprecedented funding, we also know that this has been an area that has been so significantly underfunded in years and that underfunding cuts across all areas that cuts from the crisis responses from ensuring that women leaving an abusive partner have a safe place to go to have support services that are adequately funded so they can answer all the calls through to looking at early intervention initiatives to prevention and to the delivery of education and cultural change so when we start to look at that the funding does not stack up okay and you mentioned before of course, the numbers of women who are dying on a yearly basis is horrific. We, of course, are talking about Lily James specifically, but there have actually been, I believe, four deaths of women in the last 10 days. There was a death in regional Victoria over the weekend. So I guess, can you speak to this a little bit? The death toll of violence against women is horrific. And according to Cheryl Moody, who is a phenomenal journalist who does a lot of the public work of counting women killed in Australia, the death in regional Victoria is the 56th Australian woman killed in 2023. So we are tracking at the moment of more than one woman killed in any given week. What really strikes me about the four women killed over the last 10 days is how different the circumstances of their deaths are, but the commonality being that it is alleged to have been committed by a male perpetrator, that male violence really sits at the heart of this. And that's where we have to be dedicating the resources and the long-term attention to young men and boys, to changing attitudes and underlying beliefs that disrespect women and that support the perpetration of such extreme violence. We know that Australians believe family violence is a massive problem, but we are not seeing the number of incidents decrease as years go by. So what is at the heart of it here? There is increasing awareness amongst Australians that domestic family and sexual violence is a problem. But interestingly, what we saw through the Community Attitudes Survey is that while a lot of people will acknowledge that this is a problem in Australia, they don't think it's happening in their suburb. So a lot of people think this is, this is someone else's problem. And what we know about the prevalence of domestic family and sexual violence in Australia is that most likely it is absolutely happening on your doorstep, if not to one of your closest family and friends. We are going to need everybody in the community to play a role in combating it. And that means challenging safely where you can those underlying attitudes, the sexist jokes, the racist remarks that your family or friends or a work colleague might throw around. That is a prevention moment in and of itself. Let's change the attitudes that underpin that. That's the governments committing the funding that we so desperately need if we are truly a country that seeks safety for women and children. It means workplaces supporting employees that are experiencing domestic and family violence. We've seen the rollout of paid domestic and family violence leave now. We need to ensure that our police and justice systems are effective and absolutely, I know I keep coming back to it, but we just need funding, 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 because we know that there are so many women and children across Australia that do not have safety presently. And we need to ensure that across the whole community, wherever it is, whatever door or phone they're calling to seek security, that those services are funded adequately to meet the level of demand. Dr Fitzgibbon, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. 
Today's episode of Please Explain was produced by Tammy Mills with technical assistance by Chi Wong. Our executive producer is Ruby Schwartz. Please Explain is a production of The Age and the City Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. I'm Samantha Selinger-Morris. This is Please Explain. Thanks for listening.